the Afghanistan war and U.S. Army history early missteps. In the fall of 2003, the new commander of American forces in Afghanistan, Lieutenant General David W. Barno, decided on a new strategy known as counterinsurgency. The approach required coalition forces to work closely with Afghan leaders to stabilize entire regions rather than simply attacking insurgent cells. But there was a major drawback. A new unpublished American history of the war concludes because the Pentagon insisted on maintaining a small footprint in Afghanistan and because Iraq was drawing away resources General Barno commanded fewer than 20,000 troops so as a result battalions with 800 soldiers were trying to secure provinces the size of Vermont. Coalition forces remained thinly spread across Afghanistan the historians write much of the country remained vulnerable to enemy forces, increasingly willing to reassert their power. That early and undermanned effort to use counterinsurgency is one of several examples of how American forces, hamstrung by inadequate resources, missed opportunities to stabilize Afghanistan during the early years of the war, according to the history a different kind of war. This year a resurgent Taliban prompted the current American commander General Stanley A. McChrystal to warn that the war would be lost without an infusion of additional troops and a more aggressive approach to counterinsurgency. So President Obama agreed ordering the deployment of 30,000 more troops which will bring the total American force to 100,000. The danger is, though, that it will appear to be an occupying force. But as early as late 2003, the Army historians assert it should have been increasingly clear to officials at CENTCOM and DOD that the coalition presence in Afghanistan did not provide enough resources for proper counterinsurgency, the historians write, referring to the United States Central Command and the Department of Defense. The book, A Different Kind of War, which covers the period from October until September 2005, represents the first installment of the Army's official history of the conflict, written by a team of seven historians at the Army's Combat Studies Institute at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and based on open source material, it is scheduled to be published by spring. Though other histories, including In the Graveyard of Empires by Seth G. Jones and Descent into Chaos, cover similar territory, the manuscript of A Different Kind of War offers new details and is notable for carrying the M. Primator of the Army itself, which will use the history to train a new generation of officers. The history, which has more than 400 pages, praises several innovations by the Pentagon, particularly the pairing of small Special Operations Forces teams with Afghan militias which, backed by laser-guided weapons, drove the Taliban from power. But, once the Taliban fell, the Pentagon often seemed ill-prepared and slow-footed in shifting from a purely military mission to a largely peacekeeping and nation-building one. Fresh details in the history indicate. Even after the capture of Kabul and Kandahar, the historians write, there was no major planning initiated to create long-term political, social, 
and economic stability in Afghanistan. In fact, the message from senior DOD officials in Washington was for the U.S. military to avoid such efforts. In one instance from 2004, the history describes how soldiers under General Barno had so little experience in counterinsurgency that one lieutenant colonel bought books about the strategy over the internet and distributed them, distributed them to his company commanders and platoon leaders. In another case, a civil affairs commander in charge of a small-scale reconstruction projects told the historians that he had been given one million dollars in cash to house and equip his soldiers but that bureaucratic obstacles prevented him from spending a penny on projects. It took months to reduce the red tape, the historians say. The historians also say that such incidences underscore the resourcefulness of commanders faced with unclear guidance and inadequate resources. But limited manpower still had an impact on operations, the history indicates. When the Taliban was on the run in the spring of 2002, Lieutenant General Dan K. McNeil, the incoming commander of American forces, traveled to Washington seeking guidance. The message conveyed by the Army's Vice Chief of Staff, General Jack Keane, was, Don't you do anything that looks like permanence, General McNeil recalled. We are in and out of there in a hurry. And of course, that statement is not true. Largely as a result of that mandate, General McNeil took only half of his headquarters command. But as the conflict became more complicated, requiring diplomatic and political operations as well as military ones, General McNeil lacked enough planning personnel, the history suggests. So, he was replaced in 2003 by an even smaller headquarters unit, the history says. The lack of resources was also apparent in the training of Afghan security forces. Early in the war, the training program was hampered by poor equipment, low pay, high attrition, and not enough trainers. Living conditions for the Afghan army were so poor that Major General Carl W. Eikenberry likened them to Valley Forge when he took command of the training operation in October 2002. The mandate was clear and it was a central task, but it is also fair to say that up until that time there had been few resources committed. Mr. Eikenberry, now the ambassador to Afghanistan, told the historians, referring to the army training program. The historians say resistance to providing more robust resources to Afghanistan had three sources in the White House and the Pentagon. First, President George W. B. U. S. H and Defense Secretary Donald H. Rumsfeld had criticized using the military for peacekeeping and reconstruction in the Balkans during the 1990s. So as a result, nation building carried a derogatory connotation for many senior military officials, even though American forces were being asked to fill gaping voids in the Afghan government after the Taliban's fall. Second, military planners were concerned about Afghanistan's long history of resisting foreign invaders and wanted to avoid the appearance of being occupiers. But the historians argue that this concern was based partly on an un incomplete understanding of the Soviet experience in Afghanistan. Third, the invasion of Iraq was siphoning away resources. After the invasion started in March 2003, the history says, 
the United States clearly had a very limited ability to increase its forces in Afghanistan. The history provides a detailed retelling of the Battle of Tora Bora, the cave-riddled insurgent redoubt on the Pakistan border where American forces thought they had trapped Osama bin Laden in December 2001. But obviously they must have let him slip away. It was clear that the struggle to secure a stable and prosperous future for Afghanistan was not yet won. The history concludes. So now, here it is, nine years later, and the Afghanistan war is still ongoing. And these are more signs of the end times transition days, and there are many signs.